Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Will Preach for Food podcast. I'm Doug, I'm the pastor of Faith, a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We are based out of Shelton, Washington. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today I am delighted to be joined in studio by Pastor Terry Oliver. We're going to talk about grief and loss. Terry has a passion and gift for bereavement ministry that stems from his own personal experience of loss combined with decades of pastoral care and wisdom. My years as a hospice chaplain working with dying patients and their families taught me to appreciate that sacred space and grace that one enters when grieving and when coming alongside those who grieve. Usually I promise that these podcasts are about 20 minutes. Well, this podcast is going to run closer to a half an hour or so, but I think you'll find Terry's insights and stories more than worth your time. Terry's also starting a new online grief share group later this month. And after the interview, I'll come back to tell you details of how you can register uh, and meet Terry and others on the journey of grief. So without further ado, a conversation about grief with Pastor Terry Oliver. Terry, thanks for joining us this afternoon um, here on the Will Preach for Food podcast. I've never done an actual interview on my podcast, so you're my guinea pig. Um, but I can't, I can't think of a better guinea pig than than you. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Doug. I feel really honored to be the one to break ground here in something new. Appreciate your being. Would you please tell everybody uh, a little bit about yourself and and why I might be talking to you of all people about grief? Well, thank you, Doug. Yeah. Um, my wife Doris and I joined the congregation here about a year ago as we moved to Shelton. We feel very much at home here, so thank you for your welcome home emphasis. We, um, I grew up in eastern Montana in a, a Lutheran congregation, came out here to PLU for college and felt a call to ministry and uh, graduated from Luther Seminary way back in 1971. And they had seminaries back in 1971? They did, they did. yeah, and they were pretty good. Yeah, yeah still. I'm um, class of 93, so I'm okay. not too far behind. Yeah, you're still young yet. But yeah. I have served parishes in California, Nebraska, Iowa, and out here in Washington. Yeah, you were up in Union, right? Well, yes, in Union I have um, was actually doing something quite different. I was involved in a startup of a new community congregation that was ecumenical, interdenominational, yeah. and a number of different groups supported us as we got launched, and we found that an interdenominational emphasis was really helpful in that area. Yeah. So that was up at Union Community Church? Yeah, New Community Church yeah. of Union. We started in 2002, and then I retired in 2016. All right. Well, delighted to have you um, as part of our community, and, um, and uh, hope you're enjoying your... What do you do for your retirement? Well, I am uh, very delighted to be here. So far, it's uh, been a lot of things, but fishing and grandchildren are probably my favorites. But uh, also love to garden, and we love being in Shelton, actually. Uh, like the people, like the quality of a small-town community, and we appreciate the ecumenical spirit about the churches here. It, uh, uh, it's a community that grows on you, and I'm um, glad to call Shelton home last couple of years, and, and it feels good. Even with COVID going on and, and the struggles, um, I, I appreciate the warmth of this congregation and uh, yeah, the spirit of this community trying to make things work with our schools and, and, and everything that's going on. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about grief ministry. Uh, before we're done, I'm going to ask you about Grief Share. Uh, it's a, yes. uh-huh. a new group that's coming up here in starting at the end of this month. Uh, you had a, a run of it this last spring with some folks here at the church, so we're going to ask you a little bit more about that. But let's go ahead and just kind of dive right into this whole idea of grief. Yes. Um, how would you define grief? Grief is something that while we tend to want to avoid it. It is a very normal, it's a very natural emotional reaction to a loss. Loss that might be minimal or might loss that might be severe in our lives. Yeah. And there's all kinds of experiences that bring us feelings of loss. Yeah. Uh, so certainly the death of a loved one is right there at the top of the list. Um, oh, yes. We think of that most often when we yeah. want to think about grief. But consider divorce. That is a huge grief in people's lives and families. Yeah, because it's a relationship that's that's no longer the way it was, and it's, and it's broken, and it's, that's and right. it's gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it uh-huh. ends normal activities, uh, and it requires some adaptation to deal with life in a new way now. Yeah, 
and it and it's um, there. It's a physical loss. It's a it's an emotional loss. A spiritual loss. Um, uh, I think about pretty much any kind of life transition. Sometimes I've moved around several times, and and even moving here to Shelton, a great place to live. But it it took me a little while just to kind of get used to. Hey, I'm not where I was before. The the friendships that I had, or the, those I still have those friendships, but but it's a whole lot it's different. It's different. It's yeah. different. Yes, and things like retirement job changes, yeah. economic losses, and certainly the shape of our world today inspires, or I should say it, it brings a lot of grief to people because things just aren't like they used to be. The pandemic, there is so much grieving that's going on, and we hear it, I think part of the, the political rancor that we have is going on is that everybody's just anxious and everybody's just sad. Things aren't, like you say, things aren't the way they used to be, and, oh. and we my miss Nor- that. My Norwegian grandfather would say, things are tough all over. Things are tough, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think grief is the underlying dynamic behind so much of what happens in our society today. Certainly underneath the rage and the anger that people feel is that deep feeling of loss. And yeah. if we can begin to focus honestly about that, we find we have far more in common with those on the other side of maybe the political or economic divide uh, than we would, might think. Yeah. You know, I worked for, for several years as a hospice chaplain. Yes. And every once in a while, I would be asked to be go to some kind of a community event and have a, have a booth there for hospice. Mm-hmm. And, and it was remarkable how often people would see the hospice booth and they would walk as far away around the far side of the room to avoid talking about death and dying. And I, I make light of that, but, but the reality is that, that the issues of death and dying are, there's something about it that just, we're not equipped for it. We're not used to talking about it, and, and it makes us, ang- it's grief, but it's also, and that grief is also anxiety. That's exactly right. And I was certainly not, ex- not experienced, not expecting, not trained, I had no way to cope with the griefs and the losses in my life. And so I've had to learn the hard way by going through them. What do we do to deal with this issue? But certainly as our American culture, we are less prepared to handle grief than many other cultures around the world that have adapted to it. And say the Mediterranean cultures where they give you 30 days after a loved one died to not have to go back to work. And a full year later, they'll celebrate that experience again of the loss of a loved one. Markers and anniversaries and and just time. Yes. Um, you you talk about your own experience of grief and and it's obviously something very personal and and um, um, would you like to say a little bit more about your own experience of loss and grief? Yes, I am. Um, thank you. Um, happy to share. As though it's hard to share too. Yeah. Um, my um, f- first real. Personal grief came when my mother died. She was only 67 years old and visiting us here. And it was a couple of botched surgeries from some intestinal blockage Mm. that really led to her premature demise. And so I had a lot of anger Mm -hmm. and I had a lot of feelings like the the medical community let us down. Maybe even God let us down because we were praying hard and expected her to recover. So that was the first introduction to it. Um, of course, you you know you lose others, family members along the way, but that was the first painful one. I was never prepared though for Easter of 2017 when I got the call that my brother Jim, five years younger, died at home unexpectedly in his home in Texas. Oh. And uh, there were certain questions, but it was a lot of long-term illness, a lot of medications and things that worked on him. I was on my way down to Texas uh, to celebrate his funeral service that at the end of that coming week. And I received a phone call on Wednesday, or excuse me, on Friday, that totally shattered my life when I received the news that my oldest son, Todd, had taken his own life at home. He'd been severely depressed and had a lot of struggles for a while. We thought he was doing better. He was in counseling and having medical care, but um, we did not know the depths of his pain. That exploded my whole world, my whole life. Absolutely. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, what does that do to a dad? And, and we talk about grief and that experience of loss. How did you cope? What did you do? Well, at first I didn't do anything. 
you're in shock, mm -hmm. you're yeah. numb, you don't know what to do. You try to do some things. We had to clean out his apartment and we had to work together as a family, which was helpful. We came together despite our family differences sometimes to yeah. be able to do the task at hand. We took about three weeks to have a memorial service that was a, certainly claiming God's promises and worshiping, but the sadness, the depression, the craziness. I had a very hard time coming to church again. Because again, I felt God had let me down. Um, and, and I would go to church just to cry. And of course, that made people uncomfortable. So uh, then I didn't really want to go to church very much. As I've worked with, with folks, I, I noticed how very often friends um, of the deceased, they, they show up for the funeral and they're there for the family members for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, then we're ready to get our lives moving on to the yeah. next thing. Yes, exactly. We're kind of uncomfortable. And, and here you are, you're still crying in church. And, and, and then I start to feel uncomfortable and I don't know what to say to you and I don't yeah. know what to do for you. And, and so I, I, I tend to want to just step away a little bit and maybe yes. withdraw because I'm overwhelmed and scared or confused myself. And, um, Yes, and that that ends up being an isolating feeling for for the grieving one, I would think. Well, it is, and if you're naturally a caretaker person, you don't want to make people cry, so <laughs> you don't want to then show up. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you do tend to cover your your emotions. You mask them. Uh, you tell yourself, "Don't feel so bad." Uh, you tell yourself other things you hear, like, "Well, you know, time will heal this." Which, oh, I've heard that one before. <laughs> time does not heal all things. It takes time to heal, and you have to give yourself time to heal, and, or others, but uh, time alone won't solve the problem. I like that. Say that. So, so time doesn't heal, but it takes time to yes. heal. Yes, it does. Wow, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. We have to have permission to spend that time with yeah. grief. Uh, grieving alone doesn't really help. Times we need to collect our feelings and thoughts, but then we also need to turn those into mourning. And mourning is the expression of our grief. It takes the grief that is inside us and brings it to the outside. So, so grief is the emotion, the, the, the response to the loss, and then mourning is the expression or the, the processing of, of that grief? Exactly, and that's okay. where we have such a hard time. Yeah. But Jesus said... Before he ever got, gave us the word through Paul that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, yeah. his words were, "Blessed are the mercy are those who mourn, yeah. for they shall, shall be, be comforted." Yeah. And certainly, the Middle East customs again of mourning were ones of intense emotion, and yeah. people gathered and wailed and they cried and they weren't express, afraid to express their emotions. Yeah. I, in my hospice work, I often would have the bereavement program, and I'd have these these family members who would who would again they're caregivers themselves, and so even as they're grieving, they're trying to like protect other people around them. Yes. Oh, I don't want to show emotion yes. because my grandson might think blah blah blah, and yes. and um, yes. I think I think you would agree that to to say to that person. Be honest about your emotions. If you yes. need to cry, cry. Mm -hmm. If you don't need to cry, don't cry. No, you don't, no, no. And, and you're not a bad person if you're not crying no. or if you're not feeling those feelings. No, no, no. But, but you have to be honest with yourself. Otherwise, it all just, yeah, yeah. just gets stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're told don't, don't have a pity party and all those things. Yeah. But uh, we're not. We, we just simply need to have that freedom. And I found that going into some pl <clears throat> places, a spiritual, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, retreat setting where I did have time to really uh, yeah. cry my bucket of tears, yeah, and then be surrounded with love and with prayer, and uh, was certainly helpful. And then later, I went through a very um, um, intensive kind of program. I wouldn't recommend this for everybody, but it was a week long intensive program of grief therapy. And that was very helpful because it helped me identify so many of the strands of my grief, both in my past as well in this experience, and take the dynamics of grieving that were not helpful and be able to address those and also come back to a point where my, 
my hope, my faith, my Christian motivations were able to truly uh, empower me then to remember my son and grieve, but also rejoice and give thanks for his role in my life. And, and that's a real, that's an intersection of your personal experience and the, and the working through your own grief, but also then intersecting with your professional calling yes. as, a, as a pastor, as yes. a as a leader in in the church and absolutely uh, and and that has uh, amazingly something I didn't want to talk about or touch much either grief uh here I am practicing compassion and hopefully comforting ministries to people as they grieve yeah. in fact I was after retirement I spent um, about 9 months in a congregation in central uh Washington where there the pastor was um, dying of melanoma Wow. And then later, six weeks after he died, uh, one of the elders even experienced uh, a suicide. And so it was a congregation yeah. going through grief. But I felt like there were things in my life then that didn't, didn't help me fix anything but to be with them. Just to be with them. To be with them and yeah. to be a shepherd in their midst as they went through their valley of sorrow. Yeah. And it did lead to certainly a, a time of recovery of life in that congregation. Yeah. One of the things that was helpful for me as I was learning more about grief and being alongside folks was that grief is a normal thing. Yes. Right? And mm-hmm. and it's not something that, it's not some sort of a thing that you just have to like check all the boxes and get through it. Right. Uh, it's an, an, And everybody grieves differently. Right. And so so Kubler Ross and her famous stages of grief are really helpful but they aren't a, they aren't a, a path like you check one off and then go to the next one and go to the next one they're more they're expressions of or manifestations of the aspects of grief. I totally agree with that. It's not a, cutty, a cookie cutter approach yeah. here but um, everyone's grief is unique to themselves. Yeah. So I can't say oh I know how you feel. Right. <laughs> I have no clue how you're feeling because there are your emotions. Just because I've gone through though that thing, I believe that empowers me to uh, to be with you, yeah. and to know these are not life-ending emotions for ourselves, but we can go through them and we can reconcile them into our our lives and our being. That grief is a is a perfectly normal process. It's it's natural. Um, talking to other people, um, going through intensive courses and stuff. So, so what is this whole grief share group that's starting up here in, in a couple of weeks? Yeah, thank you. Um, grief share is a program of uh, healing from loss, of recovery, and support, and it's been developed over the last twenty twenty five years and used in uh, many different churches, different denominations. It's, it is a Christian resource, but not only Christians are able to benefit from the truths that are kind of shared and the support ministry that's there. Yeah. It creates a safe place where people can experience telling their story, having people listen and be with them in that story, and they can be helped to take the steps that um, further their journey of grief to be able to have some recovery and uh, certainly some reconciliation with this experience of loss, recovery and reconciliation. Say more about those two those two words there. What does recovery from grief look like? Well, for me, I never thought I'd ever laugh or be happy again hmm. after my son died, and I had a lot of guilt that I carried as his father, and felt how somehow I hadn't done enough, and I had uh, many things there that seemed to weigh me down. And one of the things that I have been able to do is to offload that sense of guilt into a positive sense again of thanksgiving to God for both grace, mercy, and for the gifts that my son had given to me and still does, Mm. and give thanks for those memories. And so I guess I have come to be reconciled. Where I first couldn't go through his uh, scrapbook or his pictures or things without deep sobbing Mm. in my life. I can look at them now and feel the loss, but I can also give thanks for the memories and the joy that he has brought to my life. So it's 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 not forgetting the pain oh, no. or, or or the loss, but it's it's taking that and mixing it or 
or lifting it up alongside the good and the and the joy and the and the blessing of that relationship. Exactly. One person has described it as the journey of grief is like walking along a seaside. Mm-hmm. And as you walk, it's a pleasant place. You don't think much about it. And all of a sudden, a big wave washes in <laughs> from far out at sea and just like blows you away. Where did that come from? And uh, grief is that kind of emotion. It'll just boil up within us when we least expect it and kind of bowl us over. I would have to say, though, that as time has gone on, those, become, uh, those waves become less uh, gargantuan in my life and more like something I can wade through and okay. still experience and come out uh, on the other side and say, well, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yeah. You mentioned that this um, grief share has, has some Christian precepts to it, but that it really is applicable to all sorts of folks. And I think one of the reasons for that is uh, we talked about earlier about how important it is just to be with other people yes. and, and, mm-hmm. and talk about that. How is it that talking about grief with other people who've gone through it, why has that been transformative for you and why does it seem to be the heart of this, of this program here? It does not make sense, I know, in terms of common sense. I don't want to think about that. I want to just be happy. I I want to get on with my life. I know, yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, the first thing it does is it helps you know you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. And second, it helps you know you're not crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Because everything in your world seems crazy. And, you know, I'm getting more forgetful as it is. I really got forgetful (laughs) because of that grief experience. Yeah. Um, I find then that I also hear other people's stories and those help me uh, grab on to some hope that there, yeah. well, there's hope for them, there may be hope for me. And then faith does form without being preached at me, but it's a simple sense of trust that God's promises do come true yeah. and the hope of heaven, but also the hope of a, a good life still here and now does emerge for us. Yeah. When I was doing my work and I'd sometimes be um, sitting with someone who was, was grieving, they'd, sometimes we'd be talking about the weather or something, and then they'd, they'd kind of pause, they'd look at me and say, I have to tell you something, I think I'm going crazy, but this, and then they'd tell me some story or some vision maybe, or just right. a feeling or a frustration. Yeah. And I, I was able to look at them and say, you know what, I've heard lots of, I've heard, I've heard others say a similar sort of a thing. That's right. That's and right. you can uh, just kind of normalizing. Exactly. So that they could look and say, oh, I'm not crazy. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. make it easier, oh. really, but it kind of does because, okay, if other people have gone through this, if this is how other people experience it, then maybe maybe I can too. Yes, there is true. And I don't know how it happens, but there is something that is transformative, especially over the course of 13 weeks where we're together and we talk about and we... Uh, share resources, and we exp- experience this the quiet love that is there, that, that people do find new things begin to grow within them. And we've seen people who come to Grief Share, can't talk, can't do anything, and something happens, and over the course they become far more emotionally engaged and they become sources of ex- uh, certainly encouragement to others. Yeah. It really is. If I could tell you a story, I said from the second church I've served, I came to Omaha in 1975 and I was following a pastor who had died in a plane crash. Mm. And he and two of the men in the congregation who were in that plane, one was the pilot, another just along, flew into a snowstorm in over northwest Nebraska in February Mm. and crashed in the Badlands. Mm. It was a grieving congregation, and the, one of the first things I did is talk to the wife of the pastor and find out what had helped her, what had gotten her through this time of great bereavement. She says, well, a lot of people try to say nice things in Christian platitudes, and they really weren't very helpful. Yeah. She said, however, <laughs> the, the ones that were most helpful were some of the other women in the congregation who themselves were widows had experience yeah. of the loss of a husband. Mm-hmm. When they walked into the room, they didn't have to say anything at all. But I just felt from their presence that they imparted the gift of empathy to me. 
And that was certainly refreshing. And I've always believed since that time that the power of uh, a word in Scripture, which is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, where Paul says, Blessed be God, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Yeah. Comfort is used eight times in this passage. He's God of all comfort. Huh. He comforts us in our afflictions so we can comfort others with the very comfort we receive from God. And so it's not the words, but it's the message that's formed within us and it's the experience of having gone through God's comfort that we give away or we impart to others by yeah. being together. Yeah. I, we could have a whole nother conversation about what to say and not to say in, in, time, yes. in times of grief. I, yeah. um, my advice to folks, usually if they ask me, well, what should I say? My, my first response is very little. Yes. You know, the less is more. <laughs> less is more. Uh, and I think the other piece of it is, um, so certainly to express sympathy, to say, I'm very sorry for your loss. Yes. But, uh-huh. but the key, I think, is to then don't say that and then turn away. Yes. Don't, let, don't make that the end of your conversation. Yes. Make that the entry to say, I'm sorry for your loss. And then you don't have to say anything more, but you can demonstrate that you are there. You are there. That you're willing to be, mm-hmm. to share that grief space with them. Absolutely. The biggest thing you give to someone is a sense of presence. I am with you in this. Yeah. And we have to overcome our own uncomfortableness with grief and loss that wants to run away <laughs> and change the conversation yeah, and yeah. talk about the Seahawks or something, yeah, yeah. you know, but to just be there with feelings, yeah. allow their feelings to be yeah. real. Yeah. Before, before I let you go, I, I want to read a passage of scripture that I think when we talk about death and dying and grieving, it's a story from um, John chapter 11. And if you know this, if the if you know the Bible, well, Terry, you know the Bible story. But but there's a, a situation where one of Jesus' dear friends, a man named Lazarus, has died, and Jesus arrives um, a few days later after the death at the, at the funeral, really, and um, and Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha, mm-hmm. and he encounters has a, one encounter with Martha, who who's kind of toughing it out and mm-hmm. and having all sorts of faith, and you know we're going to get through this thing. You know God's mm-hmm. going to see me through it. And then there's a story where he encounters the other sister, Mary, mm-hmm. and I just want to read this passage to you and just mm-hmm. and see what what do you hear in in this passage right now? Mm-hmm. So John chapter eleven verse thirty two says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. The Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? That's a very powerful passage and certainly relevant to grief ministry because it shows, first and foremost, the empathy of God. Yeah, and perhaps some of us grew up in Sunday schools where we had to memorize a Bible verse, <laughs> and so we picked John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Yeah, because we could remember that real well. But um, obviously, there's a depth to this passage that is just uh, overwhelming. That so he was emotionally there. He felt Mary's grief. He felt the grief of the crowds even though they were kind of taunting him. Why didn't you come sooner? Um, I find that they had one of the common ways we um, express our grief that we don't realize it. It's with the two words, if only. If only. If only. Yeah. If only you had been here, God. Yeah. Why didn't you come sooner? If only. Or if only the doctors. Or if only I. Or if only the world. Well, and you, and you had, uh, as I was reading that this time around, I thought about some of your comments earlier where you said, if the doctors had done the surgery correctly. Exactly. With your, 
or uh, where was God? Yeah. And and I find it encouraging that if it's okay for Mary to ask that with Jesus right there, <laughs> absolutely. And, and to I mean, in the face of Jesus, to express doubt and disappointment in God. Yes. Yes. You let me down, God. Yes. Yeah. And that the, and that and that the grace of God holds that. Mm-hmm. And Mary's not chastised. Or, uh, uh, or ye of little faith, or any of that kind of stuff. There's, there's times maybe Jesus can say that sort of thing, but yeah, no, right yeah. here it mm-hmm. is just raw, and it is, oh, Mary. Mm-hmm. And, and to come alongside in, in Mary's grief and for Jesus to, to, to express that mm-hmm. with, with the, his own weeping. That was probably partly his own grief of his friend's death, but also seeing Mary. That's the thing about grief too: is mm-hmm. is I can sometimes do fine, but then I see somebody else, and 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 I grieve not only for my loss, but now for her loss as exactly, well. Exactly, exactly. The wonderful thing of this story is the way it concludes, of course, and we know that Jesus says, "Lazarus, come on out of there." <laughs> come on out of there, yeah. And uh, he he raises him from the dead as a sign. Everything every miracle in John is, you know, is a sign. Yeah. But it's a sign that that Jesus is the one that says, "Hey folks, come on, come on home." And we have that hope of resurrection to our faith, which uh, is not a shortcut to grief. We still grieve. Yeah. But it's the ribbon upon the cake or whatever, the frosting on the cake. It's the thing that makes an anchor to our soul as we go through these uh, horrendous times and come out with a positive message to the world that indeed God is still here and he is the resurrection and the life. Yeah. Uh, Would you close us in a time of prayer? I would. Thanks. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for the reality of your love that nothing can separate us from, neither height nor depth, things present nor things to come, life nor death. We thank you that your love is steadfast. Guide us through these days, each and every one of us. You know our lives, you know our losses, you know our joys, and you know our victories. We pray that you might bind us together with cords that are strong in love, and we pray we may be able to live out your purpose in caring for a world around us. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. I want to thank Terry for this conversation about grief today. Shout out to Chaz for his production work. And I want to thank you all for listening to this week's We'll Preach for Food podcast. That Grief Share open house is this Thursday, September 24th from 1 to 3 at Faith Lutheran Church, 1212 Connection Street in Shelton, Washington. You'll want to go to the north entrance. And of course, please wear a mask and observe all those social distancing protocols. The Grief Share classes will start in October on Thursday afternoons and run through mid-December. For more information about Grief Share or other ministries of faith, you can go to our website, www.faithshelton.org. You can also listen to or subscribe to this podcast through Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any other way you listen to podcasts. Thank you for your ongoing financial support. Our online giving option was having a glitch last week, I hear, but I think it's up and running now. You know, and if this message has touched your heart or helped you to recognize unresolved loss or grief in your life, please contact the church office. You can email us at welcomehome at faithshelton.org or go to the website. And a member of the pastoral staff will contact you to offer prayer, support, and compassion. You are not alone. As a benediction today, Terry alluded to a Bible verse that seems like a good way to uh, end our podcast. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Amen. Oh,